Thank you. Um, it's good morning for me and Sam here from the US, uh, but I'm sure, you know, pretty late in the afternoon for most of you. Um, I am an associate professor of geography and GI science at Ohio University in the US, and, and Sam is with the USGS CGIS. Um, this is a joint project, you know, uh, we have been collaborating on multiple things uh, related to mapping of terrain features. And this is a, one of those simple projects that uh, we ended up doing to figure out how to map named uh, essentially summits, which, which are called in the genus system, which I'll talk about, but essentially think of them as, you know, named mountain peaks and how do we assign them uh, uh, geometry, you know, because as we know, we don't have geometry for these uh, terrain features. So uh, Sam leads this national terrain mapping unit at the uh, CGIS Center in USGS. You know, um, uh, I have been graciously uh, allowed to participate as an affiliated faculty member. Um, so, you know, there's a link here uh, that you can look at, you know, if you're interested in what the USGS is up to with, with uh, terrain mapping. Um, this project is, is exclusively focused on uh, mapping the genus features and genus is, is a list of more than 2 million um, named uh, features with official names and places, uh, which they use for their national map. Uh, and genius features are also used for other mapping services that focus on the US or use uh, US uh, topo mapping data. Um, why are we doing this? Because the USGS is really interested in um, uh, extending the mapping of these features beyond points. So, you know, we are focusing only on, on mountain peaks, but Sam has been working with other collaborators uh, using machine learning and other approaches to, to map out uh, geometries for a whole, a whole range of terrain features. Uh, and this is just one of those uh, projects that we worked on together. Uh, and Sam is online. Uh, she can, not I think, participate fully because of her limited connection where she is right now. She's not in the office. Um, so uh, this is the national map for the USGS. You know, you, I mean, this doesn't show the, the named features, but you know, if you go to the system and you zoom in, you can start seeing a whole, whole number of named features of different types. Genus includes 65. Uh, named types. There, there's just no hierarchy. There's just 65 types. About 36 of them are related to uh, topography and hydrography. Uh, and we're focusing only one type. So here is a list of uh, a few uh, classes that relate to what we call topographic eminences, essentially convex shaped landforms, positive landforms. Uh, uh, and, and summit, the bottom one is what uh, we are focused on. How do we map out a geometry, give it an area rather than just a point. And you can see, you know, in the genus system, they include a whole lot of related names that are, you know, are reflected in the names of features. Genus only includes named features. Of course, there are lots of unnamed uh, features, terrain features that exist in the, in the country. Um, here is a list of uh, uh, the, the kinds of uh, generics. Essentially, if you take a name, let's say Mount Washington, Mount is the generic. If you have another uh, mountain uh, as part of the name, then that's the generic. So you can see that for summits, there's a whole range of um, uh, feature types, de facto types that could be reflected in the naming. Of course, that's not scientific. Uh, these are more culturally determined, but you know you can at least get a sense of you know there's a reason probably why something is called a, a mountain versus a mound versus a butte versus a knob. And you can see the relative frequencies, mountain and hill, obviously are the most predominant uh, generic name choices. Um, but there are also peaks and buttes and knobs and points and so on. And, and I've included a, a few uh, counts for other genus types related ones called ranges and pillars and, and ridges that you can see a whole lot of uh, names here. And uh, what do these mean? Uh, why are they different? Are they different? You know, we don't know all this. And so we, this is just the beginning of a project. And this is a distribution of how uh, genus summits uh, are distributed across the United States. You know, the, obviously the Midwest doesn't have a whole lot of topography. So we see the concentration in the Northeast along the Appalachian and the Rocky Mountain areas um, and, and a lot in Alaska uh, as well. Um, so how do you find genus data? If you go to this website, this is uh, essentially a very simple form where you can pick a feature type, a name, uh, maybe a state name, or you can do it for the whole uh, country if you wanted. And all you get is a list. Here it is, you know, you get a lat long, you get a name, you get the genus class and ID, um, and you can get a point essentially. And so this is what is used by the national map and you see it as a point. We want to extract areas because that allows them to place labels better, that allows us to measure things, that allows us to compare different kinds of features, relate them to all kinds of geoscientific and common sense sort of mapping uh, projects. 
So we also work on ontologies, which I'll mention briefly later, because we want to guide all of this work through uh, a, a, a landform reference ontology that we've also been working on. Um, there are these traditional terrain feature extraction methods. You know, this is these are the three one, popular ones that, that I know of, and, and my master's student worked recently on a project to compare how would you extract some of these well-known features types and we focused on generally ridges and valleys and peaks uh, using you know Joe Woods methods and, and Weiss's TPI which is a very simple method and, and GMR fonts which is very popular as well now. Um, so what, what we found from the and this, this is not in the paper this is related work that I'm presenting because you know it's been more than a year and a half since we wrote the paper. Uh, my master student did this comparison and you can see here this is from using just Joe Woods morphometric feature extraction and the, it's very difficult, you know, there's lots of window sizes and, you know, and, and slope thresholds and curvature thresholds we tried. And, and you can see, you know, there's not a clear indication of exactly uh, what to use to get a very good fit for ridges or summits, you know, and it, it's, you can do it better probably, you know, he, he, he went through a lot of methods, you know, both this and then he used GMR fonts. So you can see the comparison, the results are, are different um, and there's no one-to-one -one mapping. And TPI doesn't even have summits, so you can really use it for mapping uh, uh, summits, which is just peaks. Uh, Sam and I also wrote a paper in 2018 using Geobia. Uh, Sam led this effort, and we were trying to see if if the traditional, you know, uh, Geobia method that uh, that exists, you know, we, we didn't modify a whole lot, and we tried to ex extract out uh, individual sort of polygons for these named summits or or valleys or or ridges ranges, um, and that also didn't give us a very uh, useful uh, result. You know, there are lots of good results here, but for all these methods, they, they tend more towards the general geometric approach where we need a one-to-one -one correspondence between a named feature and a polygon. And we can't get this from any of the methods that I've discussed so far. So we went back to a, a very simple old method that I worked on 15 years ago for my dissertation. Again, uh, you know, inspired by a very simple idea that, you know, you begin with the DM pixel extract you know, sort of more basic morphometric elements, and then you start to aggregate them into getting more uh, morphometric or more cognitively, you know, or culturally salient land from objects. So it's a hierarchy, and and we need both top-down and bottom-up approaches. I don't think this can be done uh, by just you know one method. So many many moons ago, when I was a dissertation student uh, <laughs> doing my PhD 15, 16 years ago, probably uh, I, I I did work uh, and and used a basic idea of of finding a peak. From a DEM, you know, and and uh, trying to build an area around it using a region growing method, which essentially terminated uh, at the highest pass or call, key call that led to a higher peak, and that sort of gives you the, the essential top of a of a mountain or, or eminence, as we call it in a more general sense. Um, and you can see this is an area in the presidential range in the northeast uh, U.S., uh, and these are the sort of extracted out cores or representative. Uh, uh, tops of some of these most well-known mountain peaks. This method doesn't always work, especially for isolated landforms and arid landforms. See the image on the left. So here we, uh, I tried to use just slope thresholds to see, you know, uh, how ship rock or table mesa, you know, or the hogback would would come out. Uh, and and this is a bit harder because you know if you have to use slope thresholds to figure out where exactly the boundary would be. All right. And then the 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 right image is using surface networks, which you know often are the basis for a lot of hydro networks and also ridge extraction. So the basic idea here is, you know, in this in this method that we're trying to test is pick a peak, right? Grow it out to find the nearest pass that leads to a higher peak. There are other ways of terminating this, and, and then map that core that that lies between the, the peak and the uh, key core. And you can use filtering to, to sort of pick, you know, the prominence, which is the depth from the peak to the call to, to sort of get more prominent peaks. And so there's a whole lot of, you know, filters that we can use. We didn't really need that here because we were focused on only named peaks. So one of the things to know is that when we extract out peaks from, um, you know, DM analysis, and then we try to map it to the named features, you know, for which we have coordinates, oftentimes they don't exactly match up. So what you're seeing here is, you know, blue is, is the actual morphometric peak from DM analysis. And the red is the location of the current genus point in the USGS database, which has been picked up from old traditional uh, topographic maps. So Sam and I also worked on a paper, Sam mostly did this work and we published this recently on, on a simple process to grow out buffers and try to snap these genus summits to the morphometric peaks because otherwise we can't really do any uh, detailed analysis because as you can see, the genus summits would lie uh, on down the slope. And, and so that, that limits what you 
you can do with it. So snapping of this genus named, you know, improving the accuracy essentially for mapping and for trend analysis was important. And that was this sort of a side project that we worked on and made sure that this allows us to characterize the summits better. So when we use the algorithm, um, what we also had by, by great fortune is the USGS staff uh, uh, digitized a few polygons. And so we used 118 of those polygons. They looked at labels placed in topographic maps and they tried to digitize the extent of uh, named mountains in certain areas, you know? Uh, and so we had that as a reference. So we used an automated method to extract out you know, what we thought could be a representative idea of, of the top of a, of a mountain or the extent of a peak that would allow us to represent it airily. And then we overlay that with what people did manually, um, albeit for uh, label placement, but I think that generally represents what people would look at, you know, a map or, or a 3D sense and, 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 and you know, guess at least what could be the extent of it. Of course, it's not objective, you know, uh, but so what you see here is, is a huge amount of mismatch. Um, the red are the USGS reference polygons, you know, what people uh, digitize, and the blue are the uh, eminence scores extracted from an automated method. Uh, I had better results before, but I never had the luxury of, of having uh, human delineated uh, extents before. So as you can see here, some of them do fine. So if they're isolated, you know, more roundish uh, uh, peaks, which have well-defined coals, you know, the overlap is, is fine is great but if you have a very high peak which for which the the nearest pass that leads to a higher peak is very far away right for a prominent peak that would be very far away you get very large automated cores which we, of course we need to fix and that's what we're finding here um, but the results are still promising because we can guarantee one polygon for every summit all we need to do now is is refine the method and there are techniques that exist that we haven't yet implemented you know for covid reasons we couldn't uh, proceed. Uh, but, but I think there are great ideas that we can use to improve the results. So here is a bit more uh, focus. You can see there are chimney rock and a devil's courthouse, uh, cherry knob, cold water knob. Uh, some polygons do map better. Some polygons are pretty bad for Thunderhead Mountain, which is a big peak, a prominent peak. You can see the polygon just keeps going and growing. And so we need to terminate it. And so there are methods uh, to do that. So here is a knob for which we can see a very good match for using the automated and the manual one. Um, but if you can see something like Meg's Mountain, uh, it's more like a ridge. And so of course the, the polygon that the people generated were pretty, it's pretty long and we got a pretty small polygon. Um, and when you compare this statistically and you know, numerically, you can see there's not much of a, a, a agreement here. Uh, the, the generally our methods yielded uh, much larger polygons and parameters and the overlap in area is also not uh, that high. Uh, so, you know, the, the results are not, you know, unexpected. Uh, we knew going in because this is a preliminary analysis that, you know, there are limitations, but we are happy that we can at least get better results than any of the other methods we have tested. Uh, our polygons aren't that awesome, but we have techniques, fortunately, to, to sort of bring them up because it's a cognitively focused approach. We know exactly what we need to do to sort of map it down to what people generally perceive as, as, as expected boundaries and where it starts fading away, all right? Um, and uh, I, I do want to plug in uh, another paper that we have worked on. You know, we strongly believe in in using uh, uh, the top-down approach. Would be using some kind of you know approach to classifying features better, uh, not dependent on language or culture. So this is a landform reference ontology that we presented at GI Science in 2018. Um, uh, there's not enough time to discuss this in great detail, but essentially what we're trying to do here is you know present an upper-level reference ontology to describe all kinds of different landforms that can work both in the geoscientific and in the uh, sort of more cultural common sense mediated uh, realm, right? You know, if it's an eminence, it's a convex landform, you know, if we are interested in more linear ones, so we have uh, long supported eminences, long dependent eminences, and we use these terms to avoid commitment to any particular language uh, because, you know, uh, people's conceptions as, you know, my mentor uh, and longtime colleague and friend, David Mann, Mark has shown that there's a culture dependence on how people name and, and, and delineate landforms. So we don't want to get too tied to, let's say, just English or, or, or Spanish or French. All right. Um, so what are our next steps? You know, we, there are criteria that we know that we can use to, to stop the growth of our, our larger course. Uh, we want to test a couple of methods called boundary contraction and morphological complexity uh, from McKenna's and, and Chaudhary. Uh, boundary contraction is something I presented before, but I haven't quite implemented it. We want to do a better job of 
exploring the wooden Gmorphon methods because I don't think we got the best results from those methods. You know, my master's student was overwhelmed with a lot of work. Um, and essentially what we want is we want to help the USGS to sort of have an ontology guided machine learning and other methods based approach approach to doing sort of large scale feature extraction, you know, for multiple landforms. And we don't want to do this in isolation. So ultimately, if we can keep working and we find partners and we have the resources, what we would want is to create a very comprehensive open source toolkit for extracting ISA eminences here, but we want to do it for all kinds of landforms. Uh, and, and that's what I think the goal is here. Uh, and that's, that's my presentation. Thank you.